Okay, hello. This is James Courier, and uh, we're going to be talking today about how B2B marketplaces work. And uh, quick background on myself. I'm James Courier, and I'm managing partner at NFX, and we are a seed stage investing company. We invest one to three million. We invest in over 65 marketplaces, so we've been doing this a long time uh, and, and study the very details of this. What's interesting about B2C versus B2B is that B2B marketplaces investing has really peaked in the late 90s in a way that was extraordinary. I mean, there was incredible amounts of capital going into uh, B2B uh, marketplaces, and then all of them failed. It was incredible, particularly in the Western world. Alibaba, of course, emerged in, in, in China a few years later, but the investing market for B2B has really been down. It has now been coming back a little bit in the last five years. <clears throat> and uh, we anticipate that it will continue up, although it will not reach its sort of fervor level um, for reasons. But so why is it coming back and why could it be different this time? Six reasons. <clears throat> the first one is that there's online purchasing that has been normalized for consumers. You think about um, <clears throat> Amazon and, and Poshmark and all these other things that we do as consumers. Well, then we get to work and we feel like we're in a different time phase. So the employees of these B2B companies uh, are feeling this growing distance between the tools they use at work and the tools they use as consumers. So that's the first thing is that many people who work there are getting used to. The second thing is that we have a new di a digital financial infrastructure to ease transactions, to uh, bring in sort of fintech enabled marketplaces, to bring liquidity. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But these infrastructures didn't exist 20 years ago, and now they do. Over the last 10 years, they've been built slowly a little bit, you know, working with the regulators, working with, you know, the different states. There's been a lot to work out to make that happen, and that's been happening. The third thing is that the internet is so much bigger than it was 20 years ago, right? There was about 200, 300 million people on the internet at that time. It was exciting, but it wasn't 3 billion. We're now at 3 billion people, um, and that's that's extraordinary. Um, and the fourth thing is that we now have mobile devices and we have IoT devices that allow us to go into warehouses and actually upload information about um, you know, the supply that someone might want to buy on these B2B marketplaces. Or you can track where a piece of equipment is. Um, you can uh, get automatic notifications uh, that we that at, at a price point that reduces the friction for these B2B marketplaces to work. And in fact, makes the whole process for both sides of the market much faster, much slicker, much cheaper, uh, much more informed. You can make better decisions. So those hardware uh, and firmware advancements are making a big difference. The fifth thing that's different this time is that entrepreneurs are more aware of what they need to do around managed marketplaces to reduce the friction. And we'll talk a bunch about the different ways that you can do that to actually manage these marketplaces to create liquidity, particularly around logistics, fulfillment, quality assurance, these sorts of things help out a lot. And, and 20 years ago, this wasn't in the consciousness of the founders, uh, and it wasn't necessarily possible given the, the rakes they were, they were taking at the time. So that's different. And the, third, the, the last thing, the sixth thing, is really that the owners of these B2B companies are now in their 40s, right? So the, the people in their 60s have now given it down to the people in their 40s. And those people at least grew up with email. Those people grew up uh, with the internet and they are also sensing that gap. So they now have, not only are the employees used to the consumer products, but now the owners themselves um, who were the last ones to go essentially are now leaving these B2B businesses and the younger people are taking over and, and uh, they've got more of a mentality to actually use digital marketplaces. So these six things seem to be really different. So. So 2020, let's do B2B marketplaces. It's time to go. It's go time. All right. So how do you make them work, right? They're, they're, they're different from B2C marketplaces. What are the elements that make B2B marketplaces work? Let's go through them. <clears throat> the first is, is a mistake that, that many people make when doing a B2B marketplace is to think, how can I digitize the existing transactions? That's how we thought about it 20 years ago, and we've been thinking about it that way. But often, the way to build a B2B marketplace is actually to find out who isn't making any money today. 
Don't digitize existing transactions. Find transactions that aren't happening yet that you can facilitate anew with a digital infrastructure, right? Can you take someone from making no money to making some money? They might be a business doing something else, but if you can get them into a new space and have them making money in a new way, they might even build their business around your digital marketplace, okay? And this type of a mentality uh, allows you to see new opportunities to get away from what has really hampered B2B marketplaces, which is the risk aversion of the existing incumbent players, particularly the most powerful of them, who <clears throat> things are going pretty well. Why don't I just keep doing what I'm doing? Why do I need your marketplace? They're, they try to avoid it. They slowly, subtly avoid using your marketplace because they fear it. If you find new transactions, you can avoid that risk aversion and give yourself some blue ocean space. Um, that's, that's one mindset. So the second thing that we've seen uh, is the real need to understand the psychology of the buyers and the understanding the psychology of the sellers actually, because both people on, on each side really care about their margin. On the business to consumer marketplaces, they care about convenience, availability. Um, they care about uh, really convenience and availability, right? They, they're not as into price. They're just happy to get the thing and it's not gonna make or break them. You know, if they buy their shoes for $42 instead of $39, it's not a big deal. But if you're a, a digital marketplace, their business, if it's 10%, then 30%, then 50% of their business is coming through you, you can break them. What you decide to do with your software is a risk to their livelihood, to their employees, to their investors. And so they're very cautious about using uh, our online digital marketplaces because they're aware of the leverage that the marketplaces could have over them. Uh, and so you have to understand about their margin and about how they think about their margin and about their future. Consumers, when they're buying stuff, they don't think about the future. I'll buy these shoes and whatever. I'll buy this service. I'll buy this Uber, whatever. I'll do something else tomorrow. But with a, with a company, they have to think in terms of long term. And those two things are very different psychologically. And you have to understand that and build in systems and language and whatnot to, to facilitate them understanding the value they're going to get and giving them more value than they're going to get by doing it the old way, um, at least in their mind, to get past their fears. The third thing, and what plays into helping them sometimes, is really thinking through the clever pricing strategies, the um, understanding the different ways and the different levers you can pull in establishing how you price it. The best way to do that, of course, is to spend time studying what others have done, not just in your vertical, but in other verticals. What are all the pricing methodologies at different marketplaces or different online digital um, experiences? Because by playing with those as different colors in your palette, you'll be able to find the right way of painting, the right art form, the right clever pricing strategies for your market at this time given where you are and where you're starting. And you have to experiment with it, I think. And a lot of founders I've seen are very scared to experiment with it. And I understand why, but you have to find ways of testing out different pricing methodologies because it can make a huge difference to adoption and retention, the lack of disintermediation, et cetera. And so you, you have to be facile with all the different, in your mind and, and in your plans, with all the different ways of charging. Do I charge? the supplier? Do I charge the demand? Do I charge a bit of each? Um, do I have a low fee for uh, the return users, but a really high fee for the new connections that I make for people? There's so many different ways of, of doing the pricing in these in these transaction-based um, marketplaces that you have to understand them and then, and then design one that's perfect for your, for your uh, situation. And what it is might change over time. That's the other thing to understand is that where you start is not always where you're going to end. And the communication of it, the language and the timing of when you make those changes is very important. So don't ignore the language and the way it's presented when you're talking about uh, how you're charging people in your marketplace. All right. Most, many founders I've met have not done the hard work of doing the research to understand what their options are and then have a subtle approach to, to how they introduce these things. The fourth thing on the list of 24 things that make B2B marketplaces work is figuring out a network interrupt. You've got to understand that these marketplaces are actually a network of people, right? 
Um, and they subtly influence each other. So for instance, uh, if I'm going to a conference and I see other people in my steel industry or something, I ask them how they're doing it. And they want to know that I'm doing it the same way they are. And how we've all done it, if it's not broke, don't fix it. This mentality is more difficult to overcome when you realize that they have a network of people, buyers, sellers, competitors, that are all doing something in a certain way. That network gravity keeps them from moving. Even if they want to move to your to your new digital approach, they have a hard doing it, a hard time doing it in a new way. And you need to interrupt that thinking. You need to interrupt that network thinking. And there's several ways of doing it. Sometimes there's new regulations that come along that give you an opportunity, a moment to jump in. Sometimes there's new technology, whether it's digital or you know mobile or IoT or other forms of tech that, that could be applied to a new market. Um, you know, there might be a new economic reality like a COVID situation uh, or um, new trade barriers between China and the US. Um, or you could create a competitive threat. Say, if I enable this player in this market to get an advantage over the others and then bring on enough other folks to, to give them a competitive advantage that's a threat that other people have fear about, that can be enough, although it's difficult, that can be enough to create what we call a network interrupt and get the whole industry to stop behaving the old way, interrupt their behavior and move them to a new format, which is hopefully on your platform. So that's another thing to think about. It's not just the product, it's also the network that they exist in and the, the behaviors that they all self-reinforce, mutually reinforce uh, in the industry. The fifth thing that we've seen people do that's a, a good strategy is to start outside of the core. The big players who have won in your market with the existing transactions, they have the most to lose because they've already won. They absolutely don't want it to change. They have figured out processes, branding methodologies, relationships, technologies, whatever it is, that give them the advantage in their market and they want it to stay that way. They don't want you coming in and disrupting them. So going and working with them is often challenging. So typically we'll find people, either find the mid-sized people who are big enough to threaten, but small enough to adopt something new because they have the hope of moving up. And sometimes we find people going after the very smallest players and aggregating them, the marginal nodes, of this network, the people on the outside. And then again, like we said in the first case, sometimes we find people that aren't in the market at all and, and allow them to actually enter the market um, and start to cause a disruption to everybody uh, who's in the existing network and, uh, and doesn't want a network interrupt. So starting on the outskirts, starting with people, the marginal nodes on the outside is often a good strategy. You just have to make sure that your cost of onboarding them is low enough uh, because they're not gonna give you the most uh, volume uh, initially. So there needs to be that right balance. So starting on the outskirts. So the sixth thing, um, build friendships. Like if you don't like the people in your industry, if you are just putting up software and then watching what people do through your software, which is kind of how Zuckerberg did his whole social media, that's not going to work in B2B. You've got to get friendships. You've got to build relationships. You've got to explain to people, learn their language. You've got to get four nodes and then 40 nodes to trust you because they trust you, to work with you because they believe in you. You've got to go to breakfasts. You've got to go to the lunches. You've got to get on the Zoom calls and the emails and the texting. And you might even need to go to weddings or funerals to show respect, to, to bring enough people along, something that's unscalable like that, until it tips, right? Uh, and, then, and then you can build out the network effects of the marketplace that way. In fact, that during certain phases, particularly at the beginning or the second inning or the fourth inning of the evolution of your marketplace, you are going to need to spend almost 50% of your time building these relationships, maintaining these relationships, sending birthday cards, sending Christmas cards, whatever it is. Um, don't underestimate that. Although it's digital, B2B is really people, right? This is their livelihood. Your technology can break them if they depend on you. This is a long-term relationship, all right? So be aware that you need to do that. And if you don't want to do that, then you're either in the wrong business or you're in the wrong sector. You should find yourself drawn to the people in your sector if you can. The seventh thing that founders in B2B do is they seek fragmentation. They avoid uh, consolidation. And so good markets are those where you have a lot of fragmentation. Uh, and if you're not in one with a lot of fragmentation, then you need to go find some. Because if you find a marketplace where there's two or three strong players on the buy side 
and a few other folks on the supply side, it's going to be very difficult for you to get any leverage over these folks. They will just ride around you because they don't want to give up their margin and they don't want to give up their long-term leverage within their industry. They're conscious of it. It's their business. They think about it all day. They're worried about their margin and they're worried about the long term. These people will resist you uh, when they're when they're already consolidated. And the people who have a lot of fragmentation, the markets where there's a lot of fragmentation, they can't resist you because they just need to go from 0.1% market share to 0.3% market share and they'd be happy. Okay, so they're going to actually use your technology more quickly. So again, seek fragmentation. Number eight out of 24 is B2B takes a long time to get going. These marketplaces typically are, are only kind of going five to eight years in. Now, if you admitted that to yourself, you may never have started a business uh, in this sector, but you really need to settle down if you have, or if you're going to settle down into the idea that it's going to be kind of slow and it's going to move over five to eight years, you're going to build friendships, you're going to experiment with your pricing, you're going to slowly build the markets, and then it'll start to go. And you have to realize that you're going to have seasons. So what you do in the first season, the first year, might be really different than what you do in the second year. And this is true of B2C marketplaces as well, but in particular, B2B, it's even more so. You, you have to be evolving, lowering friction, you know, increasing liquidity. Um, you're going to have to evolve your, your target customers sometimes. You might have to you know, change your incentives. You might have to build software to help people do something for free so that they're willing to get onto your marketplace and do the transactions with you. So you're going to go through many seasons with this, and you just have to be a little bit patient. And most importantly, you have to be relentless through those changes, building and rebuilding your business, building and rebuilding your business all the time until you become, as Thanos says, inevitable. All right. Number nine, uh, sometimes you may need to become the broker yourself. In the existing B2B marketplace, there's often brokers because trust and consultation is required. So if I'm buying pipe and I need to use a particular type of you know, adhesive to put the pipes together if it's going to be in a very wet ground. Somebody who's selling me the pipes needs to know all that. That's consultation. That's information. Without that information, my pipes are, are not very useful. And that's why these B2B marketplaces tend to, or the, the old line B2B transactions tend to persist is because sometimes the product or the service comes with a lot of free information, a lot of consultation, and a lot of trust. If something gets broken, I go back to the pipe person. The pipe person will do me right because we have that relationship and he will get me a new set of pipes. Um, and that creates liquidity in the old world. You need to perhaps replicate that in your marketplace. So uh, by becoming the broker yourself, by giving that consultation, by building that trust. Um, so we've seen a lot of B2B marketplaces start as tech-enabled brokerages. Hire a bunch of salespeople, build software for them, build software for the suppliers, build software for the, for the demand side, and then start iterating until maybe it moves to a market network where people are building profiles, but it's still about the people interacting. And then eventually you move to a marketplace. We've seen that playbook. If we think it could work, that's number nine. That's, that's one of the ways that B2B marketplaces can work. Number 10, build software for brokers. Not only build the software for yourself as a broker, but maybe take these brokers who you're kind of trying to disintermediate and make them your ally by giving them the software. They will be putting on the demand side. They will be putting on the supply side. They will be putting data into the system. You might enable a third tier or a second tier brokerage to gain on the first tier. Um, some markets are designed where by building software for brokers, you can actually you know, sneak up on the market that way um, and really make change from the inside. I mean, a good example, it's not B2B, but Trulia, my co-founder, Pete Flint, he ran a company, he founded and ran a company called Trulia, which was in the real estate space, trying to sort of disintermediate the brokers for the first year and, what he, and get rid of that 6% fee that to many of us feels like too much money for the value added. But what he found out was that instead of disintermediating them, it's better to build software for them to let them grow their business. And that's what he did. After the first year, he moved over and they started creating things like built software. It was just a simple XML feed where they could, the brokers, the real, residential real estate brokers could post their listing, not only on their own website, but they could also post it on Trulia automatically. And that was a tool that helped the brokers and that got them to use Trulia every time they had a new listing. Um, and so this is an example of 
how instead of maybe fighting the brokers and disintermediating them right away, you actually embrace them and build stuff for them. And you can really create a marketplace that way. And eventually that company was sold for three and a half billion or merged with Zillow. Um, so it was a good, it was a good technique. Number 11, offering free or subsidized trials, right? Be careful of this. It's a good tactic because it does speed up your, um, it does speed up your, uh, your sales cycle, but it's weak. Um, so you have to be clear about pricing, maybe build a pioneers club. Um, and, and having a pioneers club that has a limited group, 10 people, 25 people, then you can charge later. Number 12, you need a clear growth plan and you need to communicate it. Remember the network density for B2B is very high. Everyone talks, everyone knows you need to have a good growth script and communicate that to people. So they trust you. Number 13, you have to create trust in this marketplace with know your customer. Last five years, there's been a lot of good technology, just like with FinTech that allows you to do this. I, I encourage you to do this as soon as you can to create trust. Number 14, here's a way of adding liquidity and, and diminishing uh, friction, add consultation services, right? The inventory and the service you provide is only part of what you're adding. Um, and so you might need to add those people on, make sure your rake allows you to afford them. Adding coordinators, same idea, coordinate the transactions. They're not really consultants, but at least they're coordinating the transaction. They cost money, they cost time, but if your rate can support it, it increases liquidity, increases trust. Number 16, create SaaS for both sides of the marketplace. Can't emphasize this enough. This is how you get what we call an embedding defensibility where you lock in the people who are using your software because it becomes part of their workflow. This gets toward the market network concept, but this is a really great tactic and gives an unfair advantage to whoever gets there first. And don't think of it. Don't get confused. Don't try to charge for your SaaS workflow tools. Just charge for the transactions. Let the SaaS be free. Get yourself deployed and embedded. That's how you end up owning. Number 17, find the white hot center. Don't just think of both sides of the marketplace as equal. There are groups within uh, each side of the marketplace. Focus on them and you will be amazed at how quickly you will bleed from that initial starting point into the rest of, of the marketplaces. So don't be afraid to appeal to a really focused niche. Number 18, focus on the harder side of the marketplace. I see this mistake all the time. CEOs say, you're on the demand side, you're on the supply side, let's go build a marketplace. The problem is the marketplaces have one side that's harder to get. And really, as soon as you have one person running supply and one person running demand, if demand is all that matters in your marketplace, everyone gives half the resources then just because of the operational, like that's a human, I need to help them. Big mistake, just put everyone on the harder side, at least at the beginning of your marketplace uh, development. Uh, you'll get a lot further faster. Uh, number 19, enable it with FinTech. Helps with liquidity, increases your rake percent because you get 1% of that, 1.8% of that, and suddenly your, your, your overall rake is going up. Um, once people are using you for their financial needs as well, it reduces disintermediation, reduces multi-tenanting. Um, Pete Flint, uh, my partner, has got a great article uh, and spoke at Marketplaces Conference last year about this. Um, very important, uh, super interesting, and enabling for B2B marketplaces. Number 20, go mobile. Most people aren't still going mobile, right? And you can give people real-time alerts and messaging, and um, you know it helps with viral word of mouth because they're on the golf course, and they say, hey, look what I'm using. Um, so go mobile before your, before your competitors do, and, and the incumbents certainly aren't going mobile. It's just sitting right there. Go do it. Um, bring people notifications and maps. People love knowing the status of their transaction, whether it's an Uber. Oh, what, where, you know, when's my Uber going to arrive? I know the status of it. That's giving me peace of mind. Do that for your B2B customers. It helps them with their dependencies. They've got people that are depending on them for your delivery or, or your service. They need to be able to inform their, the dependencies that they have on them as well. When you give them that peace of mind, they love your marketplace better. Number 22, Add warehousing. This is expensive, time consuming, kind of a hassle, but this is another element of the managed marketplaces and you've got to make sure your rake will cover the extra cost. But without this, many markets aren't viable. You need to actually have warehousing. Number 23, again, this is going after becoming sort of a tech enabled broker yourself. Hire the best salespeople, right? Um, they will join you from wherever they are because you're going to give them some equity, which they've never had before. You're going to give them a cool software based company that they've never been able to work for. You're going to be the coolest brand and the, and the newest brand in the market. They're excited. Um, you can bring them on. They can bring their book of business and you can start building up the marketplace that way. And lastly, number 24, target new products and services. If you're only trying to do transactions that are taking place 
um, with certain products, uh, you're, you're going to miss out on some areas where you can grow much faster. And the incumbents are focused on the existing products. If there's a new product in your market, grab it. Make that the white hot center of your marketplace by introducing a new product or a service, um, and you'll find that your growth is much faster. So um, that's that's where we're at. That's what I have for you today. And uh, I will now hop over to see if there's any questions. And let's see. Are there any questions? I've got a... Okay. I'm still sharing my screen. I'm looking at my own screen. Stop sharing. Okay, I'm no longer sharing. And I don't hear anybody else. Um, I appear to be live. Click the event tab. The leave event. Cancel. Something went wrong. I've got a big orange message saying something went wrong. Next to backstage, go live. Next to backstage. Oh, event. There we go. Great. Got it. Event. All right. Um, okay, now I'm getting a lot of these things. Um, Um, wow, there's a lot of questions coming in. I don't even know which one to jump on. Um, what's coming next? I, you know, as a venture capitalist, um, I don't try to predict what's next. I just look for the founders, the most passionate founders in the biggest markets, uh, where we see regulation change, where we see the beginning of a white hot center, where we see the, a new product, which gives you a new in. We see some new technology that allows us to enter. I'm 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 more uh, here to look at the patterns and recognize, if I can, uh, what the next great things are. Um, it's often hard for me to know. Uh, I don't I don't sort of come up with the ideas myself and then go look for the founders who do that. Some some venture capitalists do, but um, at this point, uh, two and a half years in to being a venture capitalist, I am just letting people come to me. Um. um yeah, if it takes five years, how do how do we recognize the potential? Again, it's like if I can see you doing these, you know, a bunch of these twenty four things, and I start to see some motion, or uh, there's some sort of uh, response from the supplier, the demand that I can see, then it's often enough to to want to jump in. Um, uh, um, you know. It's um, again, it's it's uh, it's about the founder and about the market size and then about if they've been able to apply certain tactics and gotten some some response from the market. And then you just got to invest and be patient uh, and work with them to do the right things and keep evolving through the different seasons. Um, um, let's see. Um, hi, Annie Kadavi. Um, so. How much uh, of those 24 points are applicable to B2C marketplaces? Um, probably out of the 24, probably eight or 10. Uh, I, I was looking at the, the, the B2C marketplaces checklist that uh, I did a couple of years ago and this one. And there's a few that, uh, you know, there's about a third of them that are, that are similar, but, you know, the warehousing and the brokers and, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of differences to the B2C situation, uh, B2B situation, uh, particularly the resistance, the emotional, psychological and network resistance of both sides of the marketplace. And you have to think of language, features, pricing and ways to get people to feel comfortable with entering into a relationship with you that could really harm them if you do them wrong. It could really, you know, reduce their ability to sell, uh, reduce their margins. Uh, in the long term. So yeah, you really have to think that through. Um, um, uh, we will be, we'll be publishing this as a, as a blog post um, in the next few months. So no, this isn't online yet. Uh, that was the question. Uh, is it online? Um, uh, in breaking in the chicken and egg problem, how about starting with the easier side just to seed the platform? Great question. Great question. I don't recommend it. I I just don't recommend it. Um, 
you're going to spend a lot of time and build up a lot of uh, organizational momentum around something that's not going to impact the success of your business if you take the easier side first. Now, some some markets have almost nearly equally difficult sides, in which case either side can be good to start with. But in general, most marketplaces are really strongly weighted toward one side or the other. And if you can't solve the harder side, you'll never have a business. And so putting all of your thought and energy around solving the harder side is typically, in my experience, the way to go. And if I've seen the founders focused on the easier side, unwilling or fearful about approaching the harder side, then they're probably not the founders that I want to work with uh, because you've got to dive in and, and, and do the hard thing. Uh, and break break the hard thing to to find the clever scalable acquisition channel uh, for the harder side. That's what no one else has done yet. Right? There's lots of people who got the easier side over the last 20 years, but no one's gotten the harder side. Um, one question here: It says, "What if regulatory restrictions keep you from becoming a broker? Then um, do the regulations and become a broker if you need to defeat the market that way." A lot of people apply to get their broker's license; they become brokers. And then they proceed from there. Um, if that's not possible uh, and you need to become a broker in order to break the market, then I would go find a new market. Um, uh, look, the government is at the at the center of lots of the monop monopolies that exist in this world. Uh, over years, these businesses have lobbied with states and with the federal government to employ laws that block competition to keep their margin and their long-term Leverage, those are the two things they want, right? And they have used regulations over the years to uh, keep people from doing what you're trying to do. Uh, and so it's often the case that regulations are in your way. It's often the case that you need to move into gray areas around that. I mean, you, you look at many of the B2C markets, they have you know, been bathing in gray or in, in some cases black activity in order to build their markets, whether it's Uber, or Airbnb or whatever. Um, and the same thing is true of B2B. You're going to be up against the network, the arrayed network uh, that's trying to defend their market from you. Uh, and, and you're going to have to get past those regulations in one way or another. So dig in deep, decide if you need to, to get approved as a broker uh, or if you can skirt it in some other way and, and, and get it going in a different way. Um, let's see, what's another question? Um, Whoa, everything's coming in so fast. It's hard to it's hard to read, right, Daniel? I mean, there are all these different questions. It's hard. <laughs> I think I think we're uh, we're about at time right now. But great, uh, great. Well, hope hope that was good. Uh, it was funny with no audience response, but it was great. Thank you all for listening, uh, and thank you, Daniel. This is a, a great event, uh, and thanks to the whole team. You guys are working hard, and I know that the the tool made it awkward in in some cases, but uh, you maintained your calm. Well done. <laughs> thank you, James. Thank you, guys. Only outward facing. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. I'll tell you. <laughs>